Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9 and begin there with verse 6, 6 through 10 to get started. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. We left off last time discussing the, the uh, furnishings of the tabernacle. The first room, called the holy place, uh, containing the uh, candlestick, the altar of incense, and the table of showbread, with 12 loaves of bread on it, each representing one of the tribes. Um, and then the second room, the holiest of holies, the most holy place, containing the Ark of the Covenant. And Dr. Ruckman mentioned this in his commentary, which I was reading this morning, and I, th I th thought I'd mention it. Have you ever thought how strange it is that all of us who are Gentiles, and you Koreans, you might be Shemites, but if you were not part of Abraham's lineage, you're a Gentile too. His lineage would be separated out of the Shemites to create the, race of the nation of the Jew. So all of us who are Gentiles should be interested in the furniture of a Jewish tabernacle. <laughs> but we are. We're concerned about it. And once you get saved, your sense of what's important gets turned upside down. Amen. You start taking an interest in biblical subjects, biblical topics, the history of Israel, the nation of the Jew, the promises God made to the Jew. Where did the Jew fit into Bible prophecy? Where will the Gentiles fit into Bible prophecy or the, or the church, which is made up of saved Jews and Gentiles? The church is going to inhabit New Jerusalem one day. The Jew will be inhabiting planet Earth. And uh, in Christ, the book of Galatians says, there is no Jew or Gentile. So he said, what about a saved Jew? What does he inherit? Does he get a little bit of both? Well, technically, uh, you and I are considered um, Jews by faith, the same faith of Abraham. And uh, you and I are joined in, in uh, the same body of believers with Jews who are also trusting in the Lord Jesus as their Savior. So the body of Christ, there are unsaved Jews over here, unsaved Gentiles over there. But in between, there's a third group made up of saved Jews and Gentiles, which constitutes the church, the bride of Jesus Christ. And, and in that, God doesn't make distinctions between uh, which one is getting this or that. Our judgment will be uh, to receive crowns for service at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, has nothing to do with being a saved uh, a Jew who got saved, and now he's going to inherit the earth. No, no, you're part of the church now. You're going to dwell in New Jerusalem. Trust me, you won't be disappointed. <laughs> but here we are, interested in it, when we might, we might ask, what does, that apply, what does that matter to me? How does it apply to me? And yet, here we are, concerned with it, interested in it, and there's nothing particularly difficult about these verses we just read. There's no need for Greek grammars or lexicons to shed light on anything. You don't need those things. And uh, the first tabernacle, I'll mention verse 6, that would be the first room going into the structure, the holy place, as it is called. And the service of God, mentioned in verse 6, those would be all the, the work and the duties described of the uh, uh, in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, the duties of the priest every day. The second, or the second room, 
verse 7, would be the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, the inner tabernacle of that structure. The designated priest um, went in, quote, alone once every year, verse 7, with, quote, blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. That would be the annual Day of Atonement, uh, said to fall on the seventh month, which is approximately our month of September. By the way, the month of September means seven. October means eight. Uh, what comes after that? No, I'm <laughs> um, huh? Right, November means nine. December means 10. So four months from the old world calendar still are still reflected in the names of the months on our calendar today. Because the old world calendar, the beginning of the year was around March, that part of the year. Then um, the designated high priest would go in once a year. Go back, if you will, to the book of Leviticus and chapter 16. Leviticus 16, and begin there with verse 14. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do that and do with that blood as he did with the blood of a bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place, until he come out, and have made an atonement for himself, and for his household, and for all the congregation of Israel. And then in our text, verse 8 says, the Holy Ghost, this signifying, the Holy Ghost, by giving these instructions, uh, found in, in Leviticus and in Exodus, signified something by them. And what was it that he signified? Well, he signified Quote, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, verse 8. I got to thinking about those key words in that clause, the way. The Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It says, but not yet made manifest. First Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ was the way which was manifest in the world, appeared in the world, by which the sinner can enter into the holiest uh, um, communion with God. No other way. The animals were insufficient to do it. So the holiest of all has to be a symbol of, or a reference to, Something else, something beyond the simple uh, structure, uh, the physical structure of the tabernacle. Access into the most holy place was not achieved through the sacrifices of the bulls and the um, lambs and the turtle doves and the rams. Uh, their blood was not sufficient. And it bears repeating, I'll mention it again, I mentioned it to a lady I was talking to last night that I, that I witnessed to. I said, and she seemed to understand this. She had been reading her Bible. She knew a lot of scriptures. She seemed to understand this principle. But I said, you know, God had commanded men to offer an animal when they sinned. But the animal wasn't equal to the man. In fact, the animal was beneath the man. God told man in Genesis 1 to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and over the cattle uh, and every creeping thing upon the earth, man was to have dominion over them. So the animal was not equal to the man in value, but nevertheless, that's what God had commanded. 
And so every time he sinned, he had to bring another animal to be offered. What man needed was an offering that was not only equal to him in value, but far infinitely greater in value. So that one sacrifice, one sacrifice only, would be more than enough to cover his sin, uh, his sins past, present, and future, and the sins of the entire world. That was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, uh, and, uh, but the animals would forgive the sin of the moment, but the next time the person sinned, it required another sacrifice to be brought. Look at verse 9, back in our text, Hebrews 9 and verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. The priest would go, the high priest would go in, and he would first offer animals out on the altar, and they would take that blood in, he would sprinkle or sprinkle it or touch it, the altar, um, the Ark of the Covenant with his finger seven times with the blood of these different beasts. And the entire time he's in there, he's making sacrifice for his own self, his own family members, and on behalf of the entire nation. He was a go-between between between the people and God. In the New Testament, we're told there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So Jesus Christ is now our high priest. But he would do this. And, you know, the people outside the tabernacle must have been waiting in anticipation because nobody else went in there with him, waiting for him to come out alive and not be knocked down by God for some hidden sin that hadn't been confessed, hadn't been um, atoned for in the offering. And when he would come out, the people were probably had breathed a great sigh of relief that God has forgiven us as a nation once again. And they felt fairly confident, but that confidence only lasted until the next time they sinned. Then they have to start it all over again. Once a year, the high priest would go in on behalf of the entire nation, make an offering on the mercy seat of the ark. And if he lived to tell the tale, then all was well, all was good. But if he didn't, then another high priest would need to be chosen among the descendants of Levi. Talk about pressure if you were the next guy chosen. <laughs> Imagine the pressure the next high priest would be under to uh, not do what the last one had done and be strict, struck down. And then verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. The, refer the reference is to the exhaustive rules and requirements that uh, comprise the offerings. Remember, the, the, there was the sin offering, there was the uh, burnt offerings, the peace offerings, the free will offerings, and all the details that went into each one. The, which kind of animal to be offered, how it was to be offered, what had to be done. And he says in verse 10, diverse washings, diverse washings. Um, look also back at Mark chapter 7. Mark 7, and verses 7 and 8. Mark 7, verses 7 and 8. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many such like things ye do. Though not only were they commanded to wash the instruments in the tabernacle, but uh, they were washing everything. They were washing everything. And then, of course, the tradition of the Pharisees and the priests before that took it more beyond what God had commanded. But they washed everything. They washed their clothes they want, and anything that might have been contaminated with uh, leprosy, they washed all that. They washed, the priests themselves are said to be washed by Moses to consecrate them. They washed the pots, they washed the, the inside parts of the rams after they were offered. They washed even the labor of brass, which held the water, that was to be washed. 
and um, they wash their hands, they wash their feet, they wash their furniture, and all the rest. So it was a very exacting um, and demanding system for them to, to live under. I'm so glad that we're not required to approach God with those kinds of requirements first. Amen. What a difficult way to live. <clears throat> you can't even approach God unless you're clean, your clothes are clean, a number of other things are washed, and certain things are set in order. <coughs> now, we draw some spiritual and devotional instruction from all of those commandments. I mean, better to be a, a clean, you know, nice-smelling Christian than a stinky one, right? Amen. Um, and if you're going to represent the the Son of God who is pure in every respect, shouldn't your life reflect some effort put forth to reflect that? I think it should. And I don't think that's heresy. I'm not preaching works or any such thing. But we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Ephesians 2.10, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So you clean up your vocabulary. You're not swearing and cursing like you used to do. You're not using certain words that have come into uh, common use, which when I was growing up were considered like cussing words. Nowadays, it's just the way everybody speaks. It's sad. <clears throat> and and so those things uh, serve as uh, spiritual lessons to us, devotional lessons to us, help us to draw close to God and make some effort to show that we we're mindful of the purity, the goodness, the decency, the loveliness, the grace, um, and the harmlessness of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to the sinner. Uh, but let's continue in our text, Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 14. But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, and they did in that day, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Again, nothing in this section is particularly uh, difficult. If someone can read English and they're willing to believe what they're reading, then the Holy Spirit becomes the teacher from that point on. He leads you to compare scripture with scripture and let the scriptures interpret the scriptures. And by that, he is the ultimate teacher of the Christian. No Greek or Hebrew knowledge is required at all. Verse 11, Christ is an high priest of good things to come. Those things haven't come yet. And the writer is simply saying that Christ became the high priest uh, to bridge the gap between the sinner and the promises of God already on the way before Christ even showed up. They're intended by God before Christ was born. Christ is now a high priest uh, for a redemption that is still in the future. Even that hasn't come to pass yet, as far as the, the uh, completion is concerned. Uh, the promises of the future things are emphasized in the book of Hebrews. In fact, look um, at a few other verses in the book of Hebrews. He, uh, verse 28, chapter 9, verse 28. It says, For Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time, his second advent, <coughs> without sin unto salvation. So he came into the world, died as a sinner to save the souls of men, and he's coming back as a conquering Lord to take over planet Earth, and uh, redeem the entire creation. Amen. Chapter 10 and verse 25. 
Chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, notice, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Every day you wake up, you ought to say, I hope today's the day. Amen. I get to church early every Sunday, and my brother is outside doing some work out in the yard, out in the front of the church, and he says, is today the day? And then I hope it's today. <laughs> I hope it's today. Yep. And uh, I like that greeting. I'm glad he says that to me. <laughs> and I pray that it is today. Amen. Look at verse uh, 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. He won't delay. Chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. But you and I are, are in a race as a believer, in a manner of speaking, not to be the first one to get the, to the finish line, but to finish, and to finish well. That's what is more important to God than who gets there first. I mean, Christians who have died before now, their souls are already in the presence of God. But they haven't been made complete yet. They don't have a new body yet. Uh, in my day job in the funeral business, I hear a lot of ministers say, you know, your aunt, your grandma, your uncle... They're now in heaven enjoying the new body that God has given them. They're not sick anymore. They have a new body that's incorruptible. And I'm thinking, what Bible are you reading? <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15 says, this mortal must put on immortality. This corruptible must put on incorruption. That hasn't happened yet. And so you can't say something stupid like that. But they do. They do all the time. But we're looking forward to being changed. We're looking forward to being transformed like the glorified Son of God. Amen. We're looking forward to see Him take possession and control of the universe. Amen. We're looking forward to being made kings and priests uh, like Him in glorified form, indestructible, incorruptible, immortal, supernatural form that will never wear out. There will never know pain and suffering and weakness again. They will never know uh, crying and sorrow again. Yeah. And uh, to do his bidding. That's what, our, and that's what we anticipate. Amen. That's what we look forward to. This hasn't all come to pass yet. We're looking for a new Jerusalem, a city to descend out of heaven and come down, uh, which will be our eternal home one day. Do you know the, the Mormons say that New Jerusalem is going to land in Independence, Missouri? That town of Independence, Missouri, that's where New Jerusalem will be. There'll be a great temple. You know, I suppose they mean some great Mormon temple. And that's where, where New Jerusalem will be situated. But if you read the description of New Jerusalem, nowhere does the Bible say New Jerusalem touches the earth and descends all the way to the earth. John saw a city coming out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. But he doesn't mention it touching the earth. And you read the description of the dimensions, it's a four square, and each side is about 1,200 miles. That's a pretty big city to squeeze into Independence, Missouri. <laughs> That's just because Mormons are stupid, <laughs> they're unsaved, and they're stupid. And I'm not sure which order you want to put those two qualities in, but they possess both. Kind of like the Charismatics. They're stupid too. JWs are stupid too. I saw a group of JWs this morning walking up Mountain Avenue. And uh, while I was at a signal light, I saw them coming up the, the um, sidewalk in this direction. And they were walking about like this. They're not in a hurry to get anywhere. They're not anxious to go somewhere and pass out their literature. They're just walking, sauntering along very slowly because they're logging time. They're making up time so they can fill out their reports and send it into their headquarters. And then their local K 
Kingdom Hall gets praised for how many hours they put in doing God's work. Yes. And if they, you ever notice, maybe you don't see it where you work or where you go in the mornings, but I see this quite a lot, especially on Saturday mornings and Sunday mornings, in parts of town where my job is, businesses are closed early Sunday morning, early Saturday morning, right? Up and down the shopping center, business district, everything's closed on Saturday morning at 7 a.m. There's nobody around. You know, that's where the JWs are busy walking. There's nobody there. There's no one there to take your literature. Why are you walking there? Go somewhere where the people are. But they don't do that. It's all for show. They're one of the most hypocritical religions in the world. JWs say that we don't pledge allegiance to the flag because it would show our allegiance to another kingdom that might, that might be in conflict with Jehovah's kingdom. And so we don't pledge allegiance to the flag. We don't join the military and serve the country. But they spend money that's got the approval of the government on it, don't they? They send their, send their kids to public schools and let that other kingdom educate their kids. They'll take advantage of the tax exemptions for their religion that that government, that kingdom gives them, offers them. They're hypocrites. Well, if they were, if they um, really meant what they say, they'd be the most anti-income tax religion in the world. You're not going to get me to pay income taxes because they're financing that kingdom. They're hypocrites. They just pick and choose the things that make them look good for a moment. But on closer inspection, you and I can see right through it. It's just phony. There's a lot of stupidity on display in the name of God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It shouldn't be that way with a believer. And uh, also, Hebrews 12, another verse there, maybe... Well, verse 26, we can throw that one to verse 26 whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. All of these great events anticipated the coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ, his establishment of a kingdom here on the earth, um, are just waiting in the wings to take place, waiting for us to realize them, waiting for us to be part of them, waiting for them to all come to pass. Uh, at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And boy, I can hardly wait. There's a picture on the, the wall. I think, uh, I think it's one of Dr. Ruckman's paintings along this wall over here. And it shows a kid riding a lion down the street. And there's a neighbor waving at him going down the sidewalk. And the, the title of it is, I Can Hardly Wait. I can hardly wait. But um, just briefly, let me go back to the tabernacle for a minute. And we're going to have to come back to this section of verses 11 through 14 next week. But before I finish today, as a sinner, you go first to the altar. Your sin has to be paid for by the death of the sacrifice. For the sinner, uh, the perfect sacrifice, of course, was the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All those animals and bulls and rams and goats, <clears throat> they represented the Lord Jesus Christ. But I, I challenge you to find any clear verses that show any Jew knew that. How many Jews knew that this represented the Messiah one day? I've never read the verse that says that they did. And yet, like I said earlier, that's the... That's the heresy that's being taught by Calvary Chapel ministers now, that they were saved on credit, looking forward to the coming of Christ. They didn't know anything about it yet. But nevertheless, those things typified the Lord Jesus. His sacrifice was the perfect one to outdo all of them. So, your you, first of all, your sacrifice for sins was met in the person of Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's what the altar is a type of, the death of Christ on the cross. His blood shed for the sake of the sinner and the guilt of the sinner. And nearby there was an altar, the, the labor rather, of brass. It contained water. And in that, the priest would lean forward and it was made out of 
um, brass in the bottom of the, of the container. So it was very polished. The Bible said, I think in the book of Numbers, that women brought their looking glasses <coughs> to be constructed into this uh, object. Looking glass was what a woman had, what we call today a mirror, you know, pocket mirror, or some form of mirror. Women like to look at themselves. Just to double check, right? <laughs> or triple check, too. And um, as, 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 necess as necessity requires. But um, so they brought these things and they were m melted down and, and used to construct the labor of brass. And so when the priest leaned over it, the Bible doesn't give the specifics of how tall it was, of all the dimensions of it, but he undoubtedly had to lean over it and saw his reflection. In the bottom of that labor, in that labor he would wash his hands and he would use it to wash his feet and he'd see the kind of person he truly is. That's a picture of the Word of God in one sense. Um, the washing water by the Word, the Apostle Paul says. And so you go to the Word of God to be washed, to be cleansed. And, but now uh, you are said to be a saved Christian, you are said to be part of a royal priesthood, 1 Peter 2, verses 5 and verse 9. A royal priesthood offering up spiritual sacrifices, and as such you are now entitled to go into the holy place. Because your sins have been forgiven at the altar, um, and now you are allowed to go into the holy place, and it's in the holy place, that first room, that you must live between now and the day you go to heaven. <clears throat> Off to the right, as you walked in, would be the table of showbread with 12 loaves of bread made new every day, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's a type of the Word of God. That's a picture of the Word of God. God provided manna every day. Uh, they go out and pick it fresh, get it up off the ground fresh every morning. And then once a week, you give enough to supply for two days. The seventh day, there would be no manna to be found. But you ought to go to the Word of God and uh, feed on the Word of God. Learn the Word of God. Take it in. And we talk about someone uh, chewing on something. When you read the Bible, you want to chew on it. You want to meditate upon it. And from that, you gain instruction, you gain a spiritual life, you gain uh, nutrition, as it were, as a, as a Christian who needs to be taught by God. Right in the middle would be the altar of incense, burning all the time, representing the prayers of the saints. And uh, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. You should be mindful of God, able to talk to God, at any time. And then off to the left, the candlestick, which gives, representing the Holy Spirit, to shed light on the scriptures, light on your prayers, what needs to be prayed about. That's how you live. That's how the Christian lives. He has a two-way conversation between himself and God. When he reads the Word of God, God speaks to him, and God allows him to speak to God uh, by prayer. It's a two-way conversation. And only by the light of the Holy Spirit can any of that uh, affect a blessing in your life, be a blessing to you, cause you to be fruitful and serve Jesus Christ in the most uh, profitable ways imaginable. You have no idea <clears throat> what God might do with you if you just yield everything to Him. <coughs> Allow Him to teach you the Bible as you read it. And be faithful to read it. We talk about it, but how many are actually reading it every day, saying, I want to get something from the Word of God? But you have no idea what God might be able to do with you, how He can use you to bless someone else or lead someone else to the Lord Jesus Christ. When one of you gives a testimony of having witnessed or someone uh, got saved because you were able to talk to them, or they were willing to take the gospel tracts from you without any protest, that's a blessing. You should thank God for that. You're planting seed, you're watering seed, or sometimes you're going to see it come forth into eternal life if the timing is right. <clears throat> but you live in that holy place. That's where you live. 
Think of the, the table of showbread. And then pick up your Bible. You've got 66 loaves of bread there. From each one, you should be able to glean something nutritious, right? <laughs> Especially the book of Psalms. But uh, every day. One day when you die, in one sense, you have access to the holiest of holies because Jesus Christ was the way that was made manifest to cause you to enter in. But the holiest place, the type of the third heaven, one day you're going to go there, you'll see God seated upon his throne. Um, and all of these things we'll get to in the next section were a picture of the third heaven and a picture of the spiritual life of a Christian. We're going to come back to that next week, God willing. So let me stop right there for today and we'll conclude.